Chapter 6 A military life attracts young people for many reasons. Duty, comradeship, purpose, the opportunity to test life to the limits, to learn a trade, escape from home, adventure, even patriotism. But for the youngster lacking a stable, caring home, it provides family, with all the security and meaning that goes with it. They crave the structure, approval, attention, and clear rules that their parents should have given them, and we can supply it. Colonel Gail Barrington, Head of Recruiting Grounds of Pomeroy Barracks South Ephira, Regimental Headquarters of the 26th Royal Tyrone Infantry, 17 years ago, three years before E-Day. Stand easy, said the sergeant, stacking mesh cages on the ground. The name tab on her fatigues said Mataki. I'm going to teach you how to live off the land because you lads are going to have to survive in some pretty hostile places without the catering car. Sergeant Motaki was a tall woman in her thirties, built like a sprinter, hair scraped back under her cap, with a hint of an accent that Dom couldn't place. She opened the cage to haul out a live chicken and tucked it under one arm. It clucked indignantly. If any of you are vegetarians... Mataki said. It's tough shit. We'll do edible roots and fungi tomorrow. Dom had busted a gut to get into commando training as soon as he turned 17. The youngest they'd take him. He'd relished the punishing course. He'd found hard-fighting aggression he'd never known he had. Maria was proud of him. Carlos and Marcus didn't look to him as the kid brother who needed taking care of any longer. He was, as one of the South Islanders put it, hard as nails. And now he was brought to a nervous standstill by a small black chicken. The dozen or so men with him were completely silent as Mataki stroked the chicken's head. It seemed quite relaxed in her grip which Dom found quite disturbing. She wasn't one of the usual instructors. The badges on her arm indicated she was a sniper, but everyone said her bushcraft skills were the envy of the commando training unit. Someone said she could make a six-course banquet out of two dead rats and a pile of grass cuttings. I'll show you how to trap birds and small animals later, she said. That's the easy bit. For most of you city boys, this is the hard part. Because if you can't do this, your survival chances are shot to hell right away. Dom was a city boy. Poultry came in sealed, white plastic trays from the grocery store, already unrecognizable as the free spirit of nature it had once been. Poultry didn't look at him accusingly with pinprick pupils set in vivid orange eyes. You're all very quiet, Mataki said. Come on, you're going to be commandos. You can shove a fighting knife in a guy's throat. What's the problem? Like she didn't know. She looked like she'd been there a hundred times. Georg Timieu was standing just in front of Dom, and he could see the guy was edgy by the way his hands were clasped behind his back. The recruitment posters never said anything about strangling chickens, Sarge. Mataki wasn't remotely like Major Hoffman. She had a sense of humor under that death's head badge somewhere. Dom saw a brief twitch of her lip as she looked down at her boots for a moment. We don't strangle, Private, she said at last. We snap the neck quickly and humanely. You've already been trained to do that to a human. Chickens don't usually pull a knife on you. City boys. Dom saw his baby's son's toy animals in his mind's eye and felt deeply uncomfortable. But she was right. They'd all come from the infantry ranks, and they'd all been under fire, and returned fire. Poultry shouldn't have faced them. Mataki rearranged 
the bird head down. Right. Take both legs in your left hand like this and hold the head between your right index finger and middle fingers. Other way around if you're left-handed, of course. Then you push down and turn your wrist like so. It was the faint crack and the flapping that got to Dom. Oh, shit, said Timu. It's just involuntary reflexes, Mataki said. She made it all look easy. She plucked the carcass, showering glassy black feathers everywhere, and then drew a hunting knife to prepare it, impressing on the assembled trainee commandos that rupturing the bowel was a really bad idea, and that disposing of the feathers helped conceal their presence. Make sure you find the liver, she said, displaying the alleged delicacy skewered on the tip of her blade. Now, your turn, all of you. They got a chicken each. Dom was mortified. I can do this. How hard can it be? Let's get this right before I hand you back to Hoffman, she said kindly. I don't want him taking the piss out on any of you. I've never had a trainee fail yet. It was pretty motivating. Hoffman wouldn't tolerate any squeamishness, and he certainly wouldn't have had the patience to do what Motaki did then. She walked up to Timu, stood embarrassingly close behind him, and clasped her hands over his, right on right, left on left. And push, she said. Crack. She stepped back. Timu looked at the bird, dead but still flapping wildly in his hand. That's all the force you need to use, she said, or else you'll pull its bloody head off. It got a lot easier after that. Dom still kept checking his dead chicken to make sure he couldn't feel a heartbeat before he started dismantling it. Motaki bent over him. It's not first aid, Santiago, she said. The bloody thing isn't going to respond to CPR. Now pluck it, gut it and cook it. Because that's the only lunch you're getting today. Yeah, it was dead. Dom fried the carefully dissected, bowel-free portions over a campfire in the wooded grounds and made himself eat it. But he didn't like liver. Mataki strolled past, speared it on her knife, and ate it as she walked away. Timu watched her go, as if he couldn't quite believe she existed. Why was it so hard? Dom said. Killing it, I mean. Timu gnawed on a thigh. Because the chicken isn't the enemy and it isn't trying to kill us. It's like having to shoot your dog. Always harder to kill something innocent, even for the best of reasons. It was just a chicken. And Dom reasoned that if you didn't have the balls to kill an animal yourself, you had no right to eat it. But it raised questions he had never considered before. Like where the line lay between killing that bothered him and killing that didn't. What was he really capable of doing? Commando training had pushed him way beyond what he'd thought were his limits, leaving him with a certainty that he could take absolutely anything, survive anything, tackle any odds. It also made him wonder about the depths he might have to plumb, and whether he'd be able to live with himself if he did. I'll know the line between right and wrong when I see it. I know I will. But Dom concentrated on the sense of achievement. With Maria pregnant again, Dom didn't think life could get much better or more perfectly tailored to anything he'd ever wanted, even if he hadn't realized it until now. He loved being a gear. He loved it more than he'd ever imagined possible. The very real risk of ending up dead or disabled was simply there in the background, a statistical fact that rarely bothered him. But he wasn't the only one who'd found his vocation in uniform. Marcus, now Corporal Phoenix had changed. He would never be the soul of the party, 
but he was as happy and at ease with himself as Dom had ever seen him. He was born to be a gear. In fact, he seemed happier with army life than Carlos. Carlos and Marcus were deployed again, back in Sarfouf, where winter was setting in. Dom read their usual joint letter. Marcus would write one half, Carlos the other. And Carlos sounded even more frustrated than he had a couple of weeks ago. This war would have been over a long time ago if the pen pushers at command listened to the guys on the ground. Some days I think they want me to put in a written request to take a leak. Marcus had added a comment below in very precise, small handwriting. He always wants to take a leak. It's cold enough here to freeze the balls of Embry's statue. Marcus was developing a sense of humor. Carlos would have been happier as a commando, Dom decided. The rules were looser. A man could kick over the traces a little. Dom took out his pen, turned over the sheet of paper, and began writing a reply about the art of handling chickens. Sarfouf, Northern Region, Forward Operating Base, C Company, 26 RTI. There was cold, and then there was cold. Carlos let the APC idle to reach running temperature. Scarf pulled up over his nose while he sat in the cab of the vehicle with his hands tucked right under his armpits. If the temperature dropped much more, the fuel was going to freeze solid in the engine. Shit, anyone who was crazy enough to do sabotaging emulsion pipelines in this climate almost deserved to win. A shadow loomed in the windshield, blotting out the brilliant orange sunset, and then a gloved hand rubbed away at a layer of ice. It was Marcus, and even at minus freeze your ass off temperatures, he still wasn't wearing a helmet. He swung himself into the passenger seat. Carlos pulled his scarf down a notch to make himself heard. He didn't like helmets either, but at least he had the sense to wear a thermal cap. You know how much body heat you lose through your head? Are you crazy? You want frostbite? Marcus shrugged. Ten percent, he said. And maybe. And no. He just wouldn't wear a helmet unless there was an officer around who'd stick him on a charge for it. Ever since the barber had given him his regulation crew cut on the first day, he'd taken one line of the cog uniform code to heart. A do-rag was acceptable headgear as long as it was plain black, the ties were tucked away, and the cap badge was pinned centrally. Now he wore one all the time. Somehow it emphasized the hard angles in his face and made him look like a complete and utter bastard. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing, of course. I just saw the KIA signals from HQ, Marcus said. The APC's heater roared like a blast furnace, but wasn't making a lot of difference to the temperature. Captain Harry's is on the list. Shit, what happened? Harry's had picked up more decorations for gallantry than some regiments. She didn't seem the type to do anything as ordinary as dying. The news knocked Carlos back. I didn't think anything could kill her. She led the charge on a gun position. It didn't surrender fast enough for her. Wow. Everyone's luck runs out eventually. If they push it. Her son's in logistics, isn't he? Marcus puffed clouds of vapor. They froze against the windshield. Yeah, same age as Dom. Dom? Carlos thought of him for a moment. Leaving someone alone and grieving when you were supposed to take care of them was pretty crappy. Like Marcus's mom. Oh, great. Carlos, long used to the one-sided, guess what he's thinking conversations with Marcus, was again reminded that what his friend didn't say was every bit as meaningful as what he said. Carlos changed tack. Dead mothers wasn't what Marcus needed to dwell on today. Well, 
Our luck's holding just fine. Let's get moving before my bladder freezes solid. They're already talking about awarding her the Embry Star, Marcus said, almost under his breath. It was the highest decoration for bravery, usually awarded only to those who knowingly faced almost certain death to save comrades' lives. It usually ended up being posthumous. At least she collected the full set of gongs. Yeah, you get a free set of wine glasses in the afterlife for that. Marcus made a small, huh, sound, and half smiled, scraping away the ice forming on the inside of the windshield. Maybe he was hoping his mother had died heroically too, not just run off and left him in an echoing silence with the stranger he called his father. He never said. He simply wrote a dutiful letter home once a month, from what Carlos had glimpsed, with no questions or recriminations, as if nothing much out of the ordinary had ever happened to the Phoenix family. The APC rumbled out past the checkpoint and headed for the pipeline that ran close to the border with Marande, a neutral state with a careless way of letting indie bastards slip in and out to launch attacks. Complicity. That meant being careful about where you were standing when you shot them. Carlos was getting increasingly pissed off with the niceties of diplomacy. They're a day overdue, Marcus said. He cradled his lancer in his arms, as if he was keeping it warm. Intel sources slipping. Still no activity in the town. Yeah, I'm never convinced their informant isn't just dicking with us. Let's check with the snipers. Marcus fiddled with his headset. Alpha 5 to 3-0. Sit rep, please. Over. 3-0 receiving. It was Padrick, another South Islander. All the islands seem to manufacture snipers in bulk, except Padrick was from migrant stock. He was conspicuously red-headed and freckled. It didn't go with his tribal tattoos, but he still had that islander attitude, so nobody thought it wise to mention the fact. I've been watching some tosser digging animal traps along the pipeline for the last hour. He left twenty minutes ago. Check it out for us, will ya? That could have been exactly what it seemed to be. A huntsman out trapping game, attracted by the relative shelter of the overground pipeline. Or it might have been something a lot worse. What's your position, Pad? 2QJO03134755. Marcus carefully unfolded a map a section at a time, barely moving his elbows from his sides and folding the sheet back on itself to present the relevant part of the grid. His flashlight clicked on. You up on that hill? No, not enough cover. We're laid out in a snow hole, next to the descending section of the pipe. Elevation about 35 degrees from the valley floor. Carlos glanced away from the snow-drifted road for a moment, to glance at the map resting on Marcus's rifle. It was getting dark fast. They can see anything coming up the line. Yeah. Patrick's voice crackled in Carlos's ear. We're waiting for the second shift. Let's hope they get a move on. Baz wants to check the Frashball final. He paused. I have visual on you now. The hole's a meter from the connection numbered 5 Bravo 9. See it? Got it, said Carlos. The pipeline was numbered along its length, so maintenance teams could identify sections. We'll take a look. Baz was Podrick's spotter. The sniper teams could dig into a snow hole up here and almost make it a regular little home away from home, except for the sports channel. But they needed to. Laying explosive devices was done by stages here, and it could take days when it wasn't snowing enough to fill the holes. Carlos was fascinated by the efficiency one scumbag would dig a hole and leave, and then another scumbag would come along later and drop off an explosive. 
A little later, another would wander by and leave the detonators. Finally, a fourth scumbag would show up to assemble and prime the device before nipping off to detonate it remotely at his or her leisure. Nobody was left hanging around exposed for half an hour or more, just asking to be spotted. It was random folks just passing by, and there were a couple of hundred miles of pipeline to choose from in the run from the emulsion extraction facility at Denava to the coastal refinery. All the cog forces could do was rely on tip-offs, tracking skills, and the psychological deterrent of making it very bad news to get caught. Carlos stopped the APC and cast around looking for the hole. It was about half a meter deep, and there was, and there was a wire snare at the bottom. It was just about feasible that the guy was genuinely trapping the local rodents, which burrowed through the snow looking for food. Bad, it's a snare, he said on the radio. But that doesn't mean it isn't a prep for a device. You're a paranoid after my own heart, mate. Let's recon further down toward the town, Marcus said. He stabbed at the map with a gloved finger. If there's a follow-up on the way, then maybe the timing's right. Keep the channel open, Patrick said. The last patrol left the radio on transmit, the stupid bastards. If we'd needed them, I couldn't have flashed them. Don't worry, you got the grown-ups on task tonight, Carlos said. Phoenix and Santiago. Yeah, the wankers who don't wear helmets, cause they don't have the brains to blow out. We love you too, Pad. Flash them out our way. Carlos killed the headlights and drove parallel with the pipeline at a sedate crawl. Anyone could hear the APC coming, but sometimes Carlos could still surprise the unwary if they were engrossed in a task. By the time they reached the likely entry point from Marinday, it was dark, and the pinprick lights of the nearby town were easy to see in the sharp, clear night. It was just two clicks away. The border was a hundred meters on the other side of the pipeline. Marcus put on his night vision goggles. Pat's got a point about the fresh ball. You bet anything on the score? I'm not a betting man. Especially since the Eagles signed a new guy, Cole. Cole Train. Yeah, that's about right. He's a machine. I'd hate to run into him in a dark alley. He'd rip your head off for a laugh. Normal life went on, and it kept you sane. Even war could be boring when you weren't fighting and close to shitting yourself. It swung between the extremes. Carlos understood perfectly how some guys needed the adrenal buzz, even when they knew they were shortening their odds of survival, and he thought of Marcus telling his dad that the army was probably the only place he'd ever feel alive. It was true, and it wasn't about cheap thrills either. It was about knowing you'd used every cell that life had given you to its limits. Carlos had felt exactly the same way, when he listened to his own father talking about his time as a gear. Cocoon civilian life never let you find out what you could really do or pushed you hard enough to understand exactly who you were. It was a terrible thought that so many people could die having lived around the half-full level, not knowing more, never trying more. And there was no second chance. This was the only life you ever got. Easier on foot. Marcus jumped out and waded into the snow, in the shadow of the pipeline. It stood a couple of meters high, supported on concrete trestles at intervals. He pulled the hood of his snow camo weatherproof over his head. And this is just to stop you from nagging me. The area was a big shallow valley, a gentle scoop out of the landscape, and they were looking slightly downhill for what seemed like kilometers. Carlos slipped his NV goggles down from his forehead and looked around. They waited for nearly an hour, 
walking in small circles or up and down the line of the pipe to keep warm. Then, something made Carlos hold his breath to listen. He put his hand out to get Marcus's attention and gestured. Quiet. Vehicle, Marcus whispered. It was a higher-pitched sound than a car, a smaller motor. There weren't even any roads to speak of at least other than the track they were on. Snow bike of some kind. That didn't make it suspicious. Lots of locals had snow bikes. They stood looking in the direction of the sound, and Carlos eventually picked out a small, wobbling point of light with a darker shape around it. As it got closer, it revolved into a heavily clothed figure on a twin ski bike. Marcus slipped into the cover of the pipeline, and Carlos dropped down onto one knee, shoving his goggles onto his forehead to use his rifle's optics. He tracked the guy as the bike went past, following the parallel line of the pipe inside the Marande border. Could just as easily be a woman, of course. Marcus radioed Patrick. Alpha 5 to 30. Possible trade for you. Ski bike heading your way. Parallel with the pipeline. Roger that, Alpha 5. Carlos started up the APC again, but killed all the lights. Baz might get to see the game after all. Let's not be too hasty. Marcus called into base to report the possible contact. Might just be some poor jerk going home after a night in the bar. The chances were that the noise of the ski bike's motor would deafen the rider to distant sounds behind him. And he was wearing a thick hood. Carlos kept it in as high a gear as he could, while Marcus leaned out of the cab to follow the rider through the rifle's optics. The upward slope of the valley meant Marcus could see him over the top of the pipeline. The bike hugged the line all the way. If Intel is right, Marcus said, this guy will be the explosives drop. We could just stop him, of course. Check what he's carrying. Not while he's on this side of the border. Who's going to get out the measuring tape and check? We've got our ROEs. No cross-border stuff. He's got to come to this side of the line to plant the explosives. And then we can blow his brains out. Marcus checked his scope again. Legitimately. Satisfied? It sounded stupid to Carlos, but then diplomatic rules usually did. That border jurisdiction shit was for cops, not wars. Eventually Marcus gestured to slow down and dismount. They ducked down under the pipe and came out of the other side within 500 meters of Patrick's position. The ski bike stopped almost level with the hole dug earlier in the day, and the rider was crouched down, checking through his pannier, still on the Marande side of the border. Free zero, can you see anything? Marcus whispered. Negative, Alpha 5. He is just a dickhead messing with his bike until he makes a move for that hole. And then, maybe he's really going to check a snare. Carlos kept his rifle trained on the man. The night was silent, except for the wind and the faint sounds of the guy handling something in his pannier. He had to have heard the APC come to a halt. He was far enough ahead when he switched off the bike's motor to notice the noise in the sudden silence. But he carried on rummaging. Maybe he was a genuine hunter after all. He had his back to them now but not to Patrick and Baz. Alpha 5, whatever it is he's taking out, there's a lot of it. Patrick's voice was hard to hear, even in Carlos's earpiece. I've seen the things they hunt. They're tiny. You could stun them with your toothbrush. Got him. I've got a shot now. Tell me when I'm clear to take it. It was Marcus's call. Bike guy was standing upright now, Still on the Marande side of the border, still oblivious to three rifles trained on him, any of which could spoil his entire day. Carlos could understand 
why it would be a bad idea to leave a harmless Marandy citizen with a car ground in their skull, but he thought it was worth the risk. Marandy was an enemy in all but name, so how much worse could things get other than pissing off a few diplomats and politicians? And they didn't count for shit. Let's see what he does, Marcus whispered, lowering himself on one arm to prone position and taking aim. The scope's NV filter gave Carlos a pretty clear view of Bike Guy, but explosives didn't usually have a nice clear label on them. Whatever the man was handling, there was a lot of it. It looked like he was removing a stack of books or small sandbags. That was good enough for Carlos. The hard part was always deciding when to slot the bastards. It's pads shot, Marcus whispered. You're a mind reader. You're not big on patience. Bike guy turned with his arms full and walked toward the pipeline, across that invisible line that made him fair game. While Carlos watched, he heard Patrick inhale a few times before letting out a long, final breath. He was steadying himself to fire. Any second now. Bike guy knelt by the hole, the last time he was ever going to do anything. Carlos had as good a close-up on his face as he was ever going to get. It was almost completely swathed in a ski mask and goggles, so there was no way of making a positive ID even if he'd had that level of intelligence detail. Go on, Pad. Take him. Then Bike Guy stopped dead. He looked up, glanced to his left. He couldn't possibly see or hear Patrick from here, so what the hell had spooked him? Then got to his feet. He was still holding some of the objects he'd taken from his pannier. He headed back toward the bike. It looked casual for a few steps, as if he'd forgotten something, but then he picked up speed. Pad, abort, 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 Marcus said, abandoning radio procedure. Leave him, we are pursuing. Carlos was off even before Marcus finished his sentence. He put a burst of fire through the bike that chewed up its fuel tank and ripped through the steering, then plunged through the deep snow in pursuit. You're not going anywhere, asshole, and I can outrun you. He could hear Patrick saying, I've still got a shot, I've still got a shot. Marcus was yelling at him to get back. Bike guy darted away at a right angle from the bike, heading for the border. Once he was over that, there wasn't much they could do, and Carlos wasn't going to let an Indy sit there laughing at the cog like some kid playing tag. Maybe bike guy thought gears were too old-fashioned to shoot a saboteur in the back. Marcus was almost level with Carlos. It was like running in tar, forcing Carlos into a high-bounding movement to clear the clinging snow. Bike guy dropped something, but neither of them were going to stop now to check what it was. He'll be handy for intel to play with, Marcus panted. The chase was almost in slow motion. It could have ended instantly with a single shot. Don't drop him unless we have to. The guy kept going. If he was armed, Carlos couldn't see the weapon. That didn't mean much, though. The imaginary line that Carlos had superimposed on the featureless snow was getting closer. He had his rifle, his sidearm, his knife. You're over, Carlos! You're over! You're over! Patrick's voice filled his head. He had a better fix on the coordinate from his static position. Carlos! You're over the bloody border! Tough shit! Carlos said, suddenly realizing that Marcus had fallen back. When he glanced over his shoulder for a second, Marcus had taken up a firing position and was aiming. I can get him. The guy wasn't a gear. He was fit, but he wasn't gear fit. Carlos tackled him from behind, more as an accidental and desperate lunge than a calculated move. But he had to stop him. 
like a few more meters, was going to make it any worse. Who was going to see this anyway? Who was going to file a complaint? Bike Guy straggled in Carlos's grip and made the mistake of reaching into his jacket. Carlos had always wondered how he'd react to having to kill someone up this close. But he didn't even have to think about it. All that went through his mind was that it wasn't going to be him doing the dying. It was going to be the other bastard. There was no room for any other thought. He plunged his knife into the guy's neck before he even realized he'd drawn it. Cog Command House of the Sovereigns, Ephira Hoffman realized something big had shifted in the course of the war when he walked into the basement briefing room at HQ. He took off his cap and wondered if he'd been given the wrong location. It wasn't unusual to be summoned to briefings with minimal information for security reasons, but this was the first time he'd been given no information at all and he could see he was seriously out of place and out of rank here. It wasn't just a gathering of army officers. Navy and Air Corps top brass were waiting in the lobby too, glittering with seniority. And then there were the suits, the intelligence staff and COG political advisors. It was a small gathering, but in terms of sheer authority, this was a summit. A bit too rich for my blood. Maybe they want me to clean the latrines. You too, eh, Victor? Said a voice behind him. He turned to see a naval officer he'd met a couple of years before. Michael? Mitchell? His first name was Quentin, as far as he could recall, and he hadn't been the full captain he was now. Quentin, Hoffman said, extending his hand. He jerked his head in the direction of three admirals. What are we then? The hired help? Bag carriers? Michelson. That was it. I'm not sure even my boss knows. Michelson's collar bore the distinctive twin shark emblems of a submariner. And I don't know why I'm here either. I'm just Captain D. Flotilla. So when told to front up, I face aft and salute. D. Flotilla was an amphibious assault and special maritime operations. That told Hoffman something, although he wasn't quite sure what. For as long as he could remember, Cog Doctrine had been built around land warfare, artillery, armor and infantry. All other assets had been a sideshow. Now two small elements, special forces and amphib, seemed to have front row seats for a big show. Okay, so it's Spec Ops and Frogs. Any other orphans here beside us? Hoffman asked. Only the Orbital Technology Division, as far as I could see. Odd cocktail. The big carved doors to the main conference room eased open, and a secretary in a dark blue business suit latched them open. A polished island of tables gleamed beyond in a windowless room. Chairman Daliel will be with you shortly, so please take your seats. He'd assumed this was a chief of staff's meeting, or a minister's. This raised the stakes enormously. Michelson followed him in, and they looked for their names on the tables. What the hell am I supposed to contribute to this? Hoffman had no problem telling the chairman what he thought of the Cog's defense policy, or any part of it, as long as the chairman didn't have a problem with being told. But part of him was afraid of being unable to supply answers. All he had with him was his wallet, ID card, pen and keys. Empty except for a pad of paper had been taken by security, like everyone else's. That was unusual, to say the least. Even the generals looked apprehensive. Hoffman took some comfort from that. Daliel was a small, balding man in his fifties who would have passed for an accountant if he hadn't worn such sharp suits. His voice, though, could halt a battalion. 
he sat down, flanked by two assistants, and gestured at one to shut the doors while the other readied the projector. We're soundproof in here, ladies and gentlemen, Daliel said, and soon you'll understand why we need to be. This briefing is an absolutely need-to-know basis. Get the lights, will you, Maynard? The display panel flooded with light, and the map filled the frame, the coastal plain of the Austria Republic, an independent state with a lukewarm alliance with its much bigger and more aggressive nature, Pele's. The room fell completely silent. No fidgeting, no coughing, as Daliel let the location sink in. Shit. The thought hit Hoffman between the eyes. We're going to invade Pele's via Austria. About damn time. That'll bring it home to them. RTI special forces inserted to prep the battlefield before the amphib assault. Got it. He felt better already. He glanced at Michelson, but the man's eyes were fixed on the map, as if he was thinking something else entirely. If you want to know the feature on the map, Daliel said, swiveling his seat to peer at the assembled officers in the gloom. You're going to be hearing a lot about it, at least within the confines of this room. It's called Aso Point, and if we don't do something about it, it's going to be the end of the coalition. Agent Satil, would you like to bring us up to speed? Bang! That was the problem with assumptions. They were short-lived, fragile things. Hoffman's few moments of thinking he'd worked out what was coming had evaporated. Satil walked up to the side of the display and reached in with a battered metal rule to indicate the desolate coast. The key to the map showed the area as a mix of clay wetlands and salt marsh, with pockets of grazing land and woodland the only features of military interest were a couple of small army bases, a string of gun batteries a long way to the north, and an avionics facility standing on a finger of land, jutting into one of the many inlets. Asfo Point There were plenty of targets just like this in the Union of Independent Republics. There were much bigger and more strategic ones too. Satil turned to face the room squinting against the light from the projector. These wetlands around Asfo Point were originally drained for farming a few centuries ago, she said. They're still called Asfo Fields, but it's so isolated and inhospitable that it's of more use for secure defense installations than crops these days. The research facility at Asfo Point has been developing weapons guidance systems and avionics for the UIR for 20 or 30 years, so no surprises there. But now something's changed. Intelligence shows that routine avionics work has been farmed out a chunk at a time to other places, and Asfo Point has been turned out over to a single project. It's now developing a satellite weapons platform. We are giving it the code name Hammer of Dawn. Well, shit. Hoffman's scalp prickled. How far ahead of us does that put the damn in these? Satil paused for the communal rumble of dismay that rolled around the table. Daliel gave her a nod and took over. If you think that's bad news, Daliel said quietly, then chew on the fact that they could be ready to deploy it within the year. Our satellite platforms are still sitting in computer modeling systems. Theory. So, now you know what we're here for. It's not enough to deny this technology to the enemy. We have to take it. That ruled out an airstrike. Hoffman glanced at Michelson again, and this time their eyes met. They both knew what they were here for now. It seemed that a decision had been made long before anyone in uniform was asked for their assessment. Cog Intelligence was driving this. General Ivor, Daliel said, 
Before anyone leaves this room today, I want a plan for taking Aspho Point, seizing the technology and neutralizing the facility, personnel included. And that plan has to be carried out within the next six months. This technology will end the war, for us or the UIR, but it will be the end of it. Ivor didn't miss a beat. I'll want your priorities spelled out, Chairman, because, with due respect, stealing a research facility minus the bricks and mortar, which is what you're asking us to do, is a much taller order than putting it out of action. You just summed up my priorities in one, General. Daliel took his leave of the meeting. Ivor got up from his seat and stared down at something he'd scribbled on the notepad in front of him. Then let's crack on it, people, he said at last. This is where we start Operation Leveler. In all the years the Coalition has been fighting, there's never been a more critical mission than now. Hoffman had often felt he'd been born in the wrong era, and might have been happier in the more rugged and decisive days of Sira's past. But this, this, was what he'd been born for. Even if he didn't know how it might turn out, or even what it was, he felt oddly happy. He knew better than to believe that a single victory could stop decades of fighting in its tracks. War wasn't that clear-cut. Politicians weren't that smart. But they could hasten the end. He tried to imagine what a world at peace would be like, and if there would be room or purpose in it for men like him.